Will you bow with me? Heavenly Father and Lord, we approach your throne of grace this morning in our sinful and broken state, acknowledging our dependence upon that broken body and the spilt blood of your Son. For Lord, we know that uh, it is at the cross that our sinfulness and your righteousness intersect. And it's through the spilt blood of your Son that our sins are atoned. Lord, forgive us for our waywardness. Forgive us for our shortcomings, for our wrongdoings, for placing idols before you. I pray, Lord, that as the Apostle Paul wrote, I pray that we might not be conformed to this world, but we might be transformed by the renewing of our mind, that we might feast upon the words, that we might seek you out daily in our lives, striving to serve you and draw closer to you. Lord, I pray that as we break bread this day, I pray that your Holy Spirit might rest upon us in abundance, that we might be made whole and draw closer to you. I pray, Lord, also for my brother Joseph as he breaks the word of life. I pray that you would touch his heart and his mind. His tongue might be loose and he might lift uh, those words to us that you have given to him to share. Lord, I pray that you would bless this, this body. We lay our sins and our expectations at your feet and await that which you have for us. We ask these things in your Son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. I would welcome all of you to the house of the Lord this day. Thankful that you chosen to come and to sit under the stillness of that Holy Spirit, which we've all come to recognize to some degree in our lives. I want to welcome those of you that we see on a regular basis. I want to welcome our guests. We have two from Mexico, two from Alabama, four from Indiana, unless there's more sitting there. And the rest of us are from regions round about the church. So thank you for coming. We were challenged by the beautiful ministry of music and by the beautiful prayer that we are to repent. We are to come unto the Heavenly Father and let him know how much we love life, but also to let him know, as if he didn't already know, that we haven't always lived as we ought, that we have chosen a lesser path, we have sinned. And so, this is a place for those of us who have chosen lesser paths, but who desire to be uh, on that straight and narrow all the time. And we celebrate this day, the life and the ministry of Jesus. We celebrate the great land upon which we live. And the freedoms we have because of this Jesus, the freedom to move forward every day as repentant sinners whose sins have been forgiven. And so we are here today to celebrate and remember that sacrifice of Jesus that sacrifice he made for each one of us. And we're to remember 
<clears throat> that we are to keep all the commandments and we are to remember the covenant we made in the waters of baptism, a covenant to follow him as best we can all the days of our lives. And so we invite all in this room and all of you who are watching from home, and we welcome you. We invite all to come unto Christ and to make, if you haven't, a covenant with him for our sacrament service. We ask that only baptized members who have made this covenant partake of the sacrament. We welcome all to join with us in the spirit of worship. And as we worship today, the second hymn, there will be an amen with that. The first and the last hymn, we will stand. For those of you that um, don't know Sister Resch, her son has been on his best behavior up here in front of us, Jeff Andrew. So there's a connection there if you weren't aware. And so I also want to point out that we had uh, in this very room at least 10 minutes of silence. And whenever we have that opportunity to sit under that influence quietly, hopefully you use that time to talk to your God to let him know how much you appreciate life, how much you appreciate him and his son, and how much you desire to walk the way he intends us to walk. And if you've chosen a lesser path, welcome to the crowd. We are here today to bow down before him and to seek his forgiveness and to let him know how much we love him. Please pray with me. Loving Heavenly Father, we come before you at uh, this portion of our service to make an oblation offering back to you. And Father, we realize that whatever we're able to offer is merely returning that which is yours. And that it pales in comparison to the sacrifice and offering that you've made for us. And yet we're so grateful to be able to, to have the freedom, to have the choice to be able to give back to you. And Father, I pray that we realize that our choice to give back to you doesn't end there. We can make the choice to draw closer to you, to serve you, and show the kind of love that you have for us. Father, we pray that your blessing will be on this collection, that it can be used for those in need. And to promote that glorious plan eternal. This is our prayer in the name of your Son, Christ. Amen.
Shall we pray? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed in need, indeed be thy name. Father, we gather on this, uh, on this glorious and special morning, this time that we have uh, where so many things come together in, in one place, in one moment that we celebrate and rejoice about this morning. We gather, Father, on the, on the anniversary, the celebration of the birth of a nation, a nation that you've brought forth on, uh, on this land, Joseph's land, a land of promise. And uh, we know that it is your hand that has brought that nation forth, and, and we are the benefactors of those who have sacrificed so much, and how grateful we are for that. We gather as well, Father, to uh, contemplate and remember again the covenant that we have made with you and you have made with us. We want to take that seriously this morning, Father, and, and truly reflect and truly remember. In both cases, Father, there's a, there's a price for the liberty that has been brought forward and given to us. We think about the men and women who have gone before us and uh, who have given their lives, their fortune, and their sacred honor to establish this nation in liberty and to hand it down through the generations to us. We understand, Father, somewhat of the names and the, and the people who have, uh, who have borne that liberty out of their sacrifice. And we're grateful and we celebrate their lives today in the memory of what they have done. Remember as well, Father, this morning, the, the liberty that you have brought to us through the sacrifice of your son. That it's only through his death and, and resurrection that the covenant that we celebrate this morning is made possible. that the liberty and freedom from sin that would allow us to enter back into the presence of God can come forth into our lives. And we celebrate that this morning as well. We reflect on those things, Father, the, the sacrifice that, is, uh, that, is, that has brought us to this place in our very lives and, and wonder what it is that we've sacrificed for you what it is that we've sacrificed for this nation that has been gifted to us. And may those thoughts uh, enter into our mind as we prepare to taste of the bread and taste of the wine this morning. We thank you and praise you in, in all that you've given to us and for this marvelous morning of remembrance. And to this body, Father, we would proclaim, stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. And be not enchained again in the, in the yoke of bondage. Father, we pray for your Holy Spirit to touch each of our lives. Would you make us more than what we've been before? Would you make us willing to be your people and to represent you in this world that so needs the light of Christ? Would you send your blessings upon us as we remember the covenant and desire to draw near you and take upon us again afresh and anew the name of Christ? And we pray these things, Father, humbly in the name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. Good morning. What a beautiful day. Uh, after several days of uh, uh, rain and dreariness, it's nice to see the sun. Although I myself enjoy a rainy day, enjoy a cloudy day. And it was kind of funny. Um, I think it was Tuesday or Wednesday when it wasn't exactly raining, but it was still overcast, dreary day. I uh, was going into a, a place that I work, and I said, uh, 
what a beautiful day. And the guy coming out said, uh, <laughs> no, I, I think you confused. We could use a little more sunshine. And uh, I said, yeah, but then it just gets real hot. And this is nice. <laughs> so uh, I appreciate a cloudy day and a rainy day, but today is a beautiful day. And what a great day to be in the house of the Lord and to worship with you. And we've been ministered to so much already this day. And I'm so thankful for that. It's funny, some of the thoughts that are on my heart and uh, mine for today have been touched on by many of my brothers, uh, even this morning in our uh, priesthood service, uh, which is not shocking in any, any way, but it uh, just shows the way that the Lord impresses things on the hearts of his servants. And today I'd like to speak to us about freedom. Um, you know, when we look back at the anniversary of this day, almost 250 years ago, 245, um, it wasn't the celebration of a victory, but we're celebrating the choice, the choice of freedom. And we can see God's hand written all over the formation of this country. And in a lot of ways, it's pretty obvious, even in the documents, they write, God's name. And we know that he uh, used this country to bring about his restored gospel, to bring about the translation of the Book of Mormon to restore his church. And 245 years ago from today was the beginning of the greatest social experiment in human history, or one of them the experiment of self-governance. And the awesome thing about those 56 men from 13 colonies that decided to join together and sign their names and send it to the king, a very treasonous act, is that that revolution wasn't started by a bunch of desperate men who had nowhere else to turn, nothing else to lose but it was 56 men who were very wealthy, who had everything to lose. They were men of notoriety. Were they perfect? By no means were they. But does God wait for perfect people? No. My brother Rich touched on this this morning, but how many of us can uh, recite a line from the Declaration of Independence? Maybe some of us can, maybe a few, but hopefully after today, all of us will have at least one line we can remember, and it's the last line of the last paragraph in which all the signers wrote that we do mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. They knowingly went into this agreement willing to sacrifice all that they had and many of them did. Their lives were required of them, their families' lives, all their fortunes. After the war, almost all of them were left desolate and sickly, if not imprisoned. But why did they do this? Why did they feel the need to risk all that? It's because of freedom. They knew the importance of freedom from oppression. And so I'd ask you today, what is freedom? I'd like to turn, if you have your scriptures with you, and you want to follow along to John chapter 8. We'll start in verse 31 and go through 36. It's John chapter 8, 31 through 36. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then ye are my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And they answered him, 
We are Abraham's seed, and we're never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? And Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. And if we skip over to John 1, 16 through 17... For in the beginning was the Word, even the Son, who is made flesh, and sent unto us by the will of the Father. And as many as believe on his name shall receive of his fullness, and of his fullness have we all received, even immortality and eternal life through his grace. For the law was given through Moses, but life and truth came through Jesus Christ. And so we know that freedom is truth, and truth is Jesus himself and his word. We can't experience freedom outside of Jesus. Did those men have any idea of the restored gospel that was to come, those plain and simple truths that would help us understand Jesus on a level not known before? It seems unlikely that they did, but God used them for that means. But why is freedom important? Why do we need that truth and need Jesus to have that freedom? I would submit to you that we all already know, but it's because of the bondage of sin, the consequences of our sin. In Romans 6, we know that the wages of sin is death. And death is brought about by sickness, the brokenness of our body, the sadness and hopelessness, and all those things that come from sin. And in John 3, 36, we read that the wrath of God is upon us who have sinned. Is there any greater consequence than the wrath of God? That's a heavy weight. It's a heavy consequence. Many years ago, when I first, well, many to me, maybe not many to some of you, when I first was uh, ordained in the priesthood and gave one of my first sermons, I read a um, biography or a story that a lady wrote about her first experience running a marathon. Uh, it was pretty insightful to me, being as how I've never ran a marathon. I've ran a couple 5Ks, and they felt like marathons. But <laughs> uh, she gave grueling details of mile by mile and just how it racked up and how it mentally abused her mind as well as her body. I'm not going to read that again, but I want to use a similar analogy. And being that I just came back from mountain camp a little over a week ago, Friday, um, in fact, I had to wear my uh, comfortable shoes today because I got huge blisters on the back of my feet and I can't fit in those hard uh, dress shoes. So. <laughs> uh, but if we were to imagine climbing the mountain of the Lord, the biggest mountain we could imagine, uh, Brennan, would that, be, uh, would that be easier for you or me? Probably you, yeah, I agree. <laughs> well, I'm going to do a demonstration, and since Peyton was in my family, and he was definitely the best hiker, mountain climber in our family, I'd like to ask Peyton to come up here real quick. Now, I checked with Peyton ahead of time, so to not put him on the spot, I'm sure he's still a little nervous. If you just stand up here. Um, so, if we relate... Climbing a mountain to the race of life, like we read about in the scriptures. Um, it's easy to imagine Peyton climbing any mountain with little resistance. Uh, 
But if we were to add on that baggage, that weight of sin onto Peyton, it would make it more difficult, wouldn't it? Luckily, I have a couple representations for us. Peyton, this will be your mountain camp backpack. Go ahead and put that on. In lieu of having Peyton tell us some of his sins that we can fill his backpack with, I'll just have us here in the congregation raise our hands if we have a sin that we struggle with, a sin that we want to get rid of, but we love too much, and we go back to it. Raise your hand if you can relay with that. Well, that's quite a few. I'd say, I think this is probably an accurate representation. <laughs> Now, the hymnals do not represent sin normally. <laughs> How are you feeling, Peyton? You think you can still beat me up the mountain? Probably so. <laughs> it doesn't seem fair yet. Good thing I brought reinforcements. How's that feel? Yeah, <laughs> you can take it off. Thank you. You can have a seat. Thank you, Peyton. Those are the sins that each one of us, when I asked that question, could just think of off the top of our heads, the ones that we know that we struggle against. I'd like to turn to Matthew 25, 43 through 46. That's Matthew 25, 43, and we'll go down through 46. For I was hungered, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in. Naked, and ye clothed me not. Sick and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee unhungered, or thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee. Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye did it not to the one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it not unto me. And so we read there that there's many sins that we are not even aware of, the sins that we omit, willingly or unwillingly, that we also carry the burdens for, that also weigh us down, that make it harder to climb that mountain, to run that race, to live life free. Brothers and sisters, the Lord sees our sins. He tells us in 1 Samuel 2, 3, that he's going to weigh our sins, that we are to not talk prideful and arrogant, but the Lord will weigh our actions. And in Proverbs 16, he says that all men's ways are clean in their own eyes, but the Lord weigheth his spirit. And in Daniel 5, 27, he says, Thou art weighed in the balances and yet found wanting. We will be weighed on a scale of judgment. What will we be weighed against? Maybe the Ten Commandments? Maybe the law of love, the higher love in Matthew 22, 
34 through 39. When Jesus says, then one of them, a lawyer tempting him, asked, saying to Jesus, Master, which one of the great commandments in the law? Which one is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. One of these two commandments hang on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. If we were weighed against that, how would any of us fare? Maybe we, uh, we should think of our life being weighed against the life of Jesus. And when we think of it in that terms, the guilt sets in. None of us would balance out would weigh the, the right amount compared to the life of Jesus. And so knowing that, feeling that guilt, we automatically at a young age try to hide our sins. You don't have to teach a toddler how to hide a mess when they know they're not supposed to make a mess. It's that human nature, that guilt I'd like for us to go to uh, Mormon chapter 4, verse 59. That's uh, Mormon chapter 4, starting in verse 59. Yea, in that great day, when ye shall be brought to stand before the Lamb of God, then will ye say that there is no God. Then will ye longer deny Christ? Or can ye behold the Lamb of God? Do ye suppose that ye shall dwell with him under a consciousness of your guilt? Do ye suppose that ye could be happy to dwell with that holy being when your souls are racked with consciousness of your guilt that ye have ever abused his laws? Even in that day of judgment, when we're weighed on that scale, before anyone accuses us of anything, we will know that guilt will weigh heavy on our hearts and our minds. We will be so uncomfortable in that place with those sins on our back. And so we must evaluate what is the purpose of our life. My brother, uh, Peter Cornish, went to mountain camp with us, and he he had a great class, and he asked the kids that question. And he he was trying to encourage them to be introspective and to really think about how the gospel relates to them and ask them, why did God put you here? What is the purpose of your life being here? He gave them some time to think about that and then get in groups and to share about it for five minutes. And inevitably, even in the counselor's groups, We shared, the three of us shared, and uh, five minutes wasn't up. And we kept sharing about other things until the five minutes was up. And when he brought us back together, he asked us how many of us used all the five minutes to share about why God had put us here and what the reason for us being where we are in our lives. And it was all done just to point out how such a big question that's so important to our faith and who we are, we can, uh, we can sum up in a couple seconds, maybe 30 seconds. But if I was to ask Larry to share about the Royals' history or their greatest moments, I better clear my schedule because he's going to have some time to do that. <laughs> it's going to last more than 30 seconds. If I asked any one of you to share about something you enjoy in your hobby, You've spent a lot of time thinking about that and pondering it. So, brothers and sisters, we need to spend time pondering and reasoning our reason for our the reason why God put us here and our reason to be in this work. I'd like to go to Alma 16. 
This is a great scripture that Peter shared when, uh, when he challenged the kids on this to get them thinking about the reason why we're here. Alma 16, uh, verse 227 down to 230. Yea, I would that ye would come forth and harden not your hearts any longer. For behold, now is the time and the day of your salvation. And therefore, if ye will repent and harden not your hearts, immediately shall the great plan of redemption be brought about unto you. For behold, this life is the time for men to prepare to meet God. I'll read that again. For behold, this life. is the time for men to prepare to meet God. Yea, behold, the day of this life is the day for men to perform their labors. And now, as I said unto you before, as ye have had so many witnesses, therefore I beseech of you that you do not procrastinate the day of your repentance until the end. For after this day of life, which is given unto us to prepare for eternity. Behold, if we do not improve our time while in this life, then cometh the night of darkness, wherein there can be no labor performed. And so our good works, our preparation for the Lord, are the reason we are here. And I would challenge you to find out for yourself why God put you where you are, to seek him and what work he has for you. We know that God himself, Jesus, is the only good. Even when they asked him who was good, he said it was his father above. And so what good work can we perform on our own? I would say that the only good work we can perform is our agency, we can choose. We can choose God. And like my brother Eldon and many others shared today, we need to choose God day by day. Not only once a month when we're before this table, not only in our Sunday uh, quiet times or Wednesday night prayer service or our daily quiet times, But yet, moment by moment, we need to choose God, to choose that freedom that comes through the power of his spirit. You know, my brother John Owings, in small group this past uh, uh, Wednesday night, he answered a question that was given to us about if you could give anybody a gift, anyone, Any gift, what would you give them? And a lot of us shared about uh, the gift of the love of Jesus and how that transforms our lives. And John mentioned how, for those that haven't experienced that, and I'm sure John can relate, and I know that I can, it seems like too much to give up. It's too much to sacrifice. Those sins are comfortable. But brothers and sisters, the freedom of the relief of that weight far outweighs the uncomfortableness of leaving those sins behind. For every choice in life has sacrifices and difficulty. A couple things that came to my mind when dealing with success over sins that we struggle with are removing ourselves from the temptation, taking those friendships that bring us down and removing ourselves from those situations, distancing ourselves. We don't have to cut off those friendships, but don't place ourselves in situations that we know are going to harm our decision-making. Maybe remove those apps off your phone that keep tempting you. Maybe get rid of that streaming service, that show that you watch that's not edifying. 
or a podcast that you listen to or anything that we do that's comfortable, that feels good. It's our guilty pleasure, but draws us away. Another great thing that was brought up at Mountain Camp, a class that was taught that I really love, was creating new friendships or maybe growing ones that you already have into a, a friendship of accountability. Maybe you can do this with a, a wife or a husband. Maybe you could even do this with a father or a mother, a brother or a sister. But I don't think there's enough importance placed on the gift of accountability and what that can do to our lives. But first it takes vulnerability and a desire to be free. And so my prayer and my desire this day is that we will each choose freedom. Not the blow up a bunch of mortars type of freedom, although that's going to be fun later for those of us that enjoy doing that. But the type of freedom from the type of oppression that can follow us through any border, any country, anywhere in the world. The oppression that you can never escape from. The oppression of sin as it weighs you down and makes you feel stuck in a rut, a rut of unhappiness. For we know that this table and this act that we did today is a physical representation of that freedom. When we were eating that bread and drinking that wine, it's an expression of the greatest freedom and the greatest sacrifice that could ever be given. And that was when Jesus, much like those 56 men, sacrificed all that he had. He sacrificed much, much more to come down and take on flesh, to take on sin that he didn't deserve, and to willingly uh, give it to you and me who continue to fill our backpacks with sin. I thank you for your time this day and your attention, and I pray that we would leave here a changed people and that we would desire to lay those sins down and to instead choose freedom. Thank you. Our most gracious and eternal Heavenly Father, may we uh, take time to be holy, Father. May we take time to speak with you. May we take time to listen to you, Father. As I've looked over your children this day, your sons and your daughters, Father, I know that they are not here for any uncertain reasons, but they are here for specific reasons. You have placed them in this land of promise. You have placed them on this earth for specific reasons. You have given them their gifts and their talents. And Father, I'd ask that this day that you may bless them. Father, I know that uh, many times we take for granted our freedom. Many times we take for granted your son, Jesus Christ. But I'd ask this, this day, Father, that we would look in deep into our souls and find that truth, that truth of your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, may we find that joy and that peace that comes from your Son, Jesus Christ, no matter where our journey takes us, or may, even through those times of trials and tribulation, Father, may we find peace and joy because we know that you are with us. Father, this day we give you honor and glory for our freedom, for our freedom to worship, for our freedom to be able to come to you with everything we have and know that you, you love us beyond our comprehension, Father. 
and that you will always be with us, no matter what. So, Father, bless us this day as we celebrate our freedom, as we celebrate your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, and we pray this in the, the name of your risen Savior, our Jesus Christ. Amen.